My name is Ravi Ravindra and I live in Nova Scotia, just outside the capital, Halifax. As my <laughs> primary teacher, well, primary in the sense of time sequence, perhaps is one way to approach this. I was, maybe I should tell you, I, from very early on in my life, used to be just rather very negative to the priests in India. As far as I was concerned, they were mostly just fleecing people and eating a lot and getting, <laughs> and, but were not doing anything useful. However, my whole, if you like, the general domain of religion or spirituality, I think I was very much influenced, first of all, by Vivekananda, who very much struck me, even as a young, really more or less a young boy, you know, he was saying, you can dismiss the rituals, the temples, the priests, but that religion is really for the strong rather than for the weak, which was otherwise the impression one gets in the society, that those people who can't do anything else turn to some priests or ministers to get some help. Vivekananda was a very strong man and also tried to bring as much as rationality as can be brought. These areas are not really subject to rationality so much in the ordinary sense of the word, but to bring an intelligence. So I think he was really in that sense my first teacher, if not primary in the sense of necessarily the most significant or continuing in my life. Later on, for me, I would raise many of these questions, which even actually my professor of physics, curiously, in India, said to me, what you're asking is how to find God. I was so startled by this, because that's not what I thought at all interested me. I had dismissed this whole business of God, etc. <laughs> but he thought that the kind of questions I'm raising really belong to that category, which so completely surprised me that I had just finished, just finishing actually, Master of Technology in Oil Exploration. As I sometimes say to my friends, I should have stayed in that field. I could actually be rich by this time. However, I began to feel partly many questions were arising in my mind that in technology we have all sorts of techniques and we occasionally even could find oil but there seemed to be no principles somehow, to me anyway. So it was partly the advice of my, really I would say mentor professor, phys physics professor, advising me to study physics. And meanwhile, in my case, I'm always assisted by the devas. I don't actually do anything on my own. I'm completely convinced of this. So some deva or the other arranged I got a fancy scholarship called Commonwealth Scholarship. So I could go anywhere in the Commonwealth. So I decided to actually come to Toronto because there was a very well known, in this case, a geophysicist who interested me very much. He's responsible for the whole idea of continental drift, etc. I don't need to get into the details of this. Tuzo Wilson was his name. So I came to Toronto really largely because of him. And uh, so, but then because my background was not strictly speaking in physics, so I had to do an MSc in physics, then a PhD. But coming to Canada was a total revolution for me because people would ask me questions about India and I realized that although I am an Indian, but I don't know anything about the whole grand Indian tradition. And you don't get this like osmosis by, you don't, it's not like getting infection by being next to somebody, <laughs> one has to work very hard to get a sense of what is the tradition. In fact, I very soon discovered almost everybody who labeled themselves Christian in Canada, they didn't know anything about Christianity either. That it is, the ignorance is much more prevailing <laughs> than one realized. So for me, it was a shock to discover that although I'm an Indian, and Vivekananda was a great help, but still not in any great depth that I, partly because I had not spent any time doing this. I was doing master technology. And in India there was, at that time, it's probably still true. I'm not entirely sure of this at present. But certainly, you know, I was just soon after independence in India, there was a big emphasis on 
science and technology that any student who did well, which simply really meant getting good marks, it didn't mean anything else, but if you were a smart student getting good marks, you would naturally go into engineering, much more than anything else, uh, certainly much more than medicine at that time, maybe now medicine may be, a, or now I think business probably is another thing being promoted, management or business, but in my days, it, it didn't require any consideration. If you were a good student, you went into engineering. And Nehru, who was the first prime minister, used to actually refer to these colleges of engineering as the temples of New India. So, therefore, I went into <laughs> engineering. <laughs> and, I mean, but I don't think by my swabhav or my inner being that this is relief. I think although I have had difficulty with philosophers as well, but I think by nature I am really more a philosopher than anything else. Um, so, but coming to Canada was a great revolution for me. So I started learning both about the, of course, the religion in Canada, which is primary religion being Christianity, but also something about India. And in India we don't make that radically distinction between philosophy and religion. In fact, it may surprise most people here. Very few universities in India have departments of religion. Uh, it's, it seems strange because everybody thinks India is a very religious country and therefore they ought to have departments of religion. Very few universities have this. So then I used to go and sit in the philosophy department, audit courses. In fact, enough courses I did, my professor in philosophy said, why don't you get an MA in philosophy? That would have delayed me by a year because my Commonwealth scholarship was going to last, not last that long. So I didn't do it. But later on, when I was actually teaching physics in Canada as a professor, I did an MA in philosophy on the side. So here I have a Master of Technology, Master of Science, Master of Arts, slave of everything. <laughs> not knowing very much. So that's my life. <laughs> Actually, also to maybe slightly to go back, you asked me who is my primary teacher. Primary now in the sense of most significant in my life. I would regard Madame de Salzman. She was really the chief disciple, pupil, student of Gurdjieff. And after Gurdjieff died in 1949, she was regarded by all, everybody around as the person carrying that tradition. And until her own death, which was in 1990. So as you can see, for 41 years, she was really the head of the work. Uh, Gurdjieff teaching is often called the work. And uh, also another label, the fourth way. And she herself died at the age of 101. And I was very fortunate to be able to work with her quite closely over the last nearly 11 years of her life. So I would probably, if I had to label one person, this is not necessary to do actually, especially my impression is, particularly in the Indian tradition, it's quite common that a teacher or a guru, after a little while may send you to somebody else to work with. Because they feel that you need something else and some other teacher is more likely to be helpful. So this is not, one doesn't need to get so attached to this, but still, if I had to label one teacher in my life, I would say, say Madame de Salzman, but I have been very much influenced by several other people. For example, Krishnamurti. Qualities of a good student. Not accepting anything easily. Questioning, wrestling. If you take anything seriously, now, there are different kinds of studies, by the way. There are things which are more information-oriented. Well, that's a slightly different kind of requirement, but I'm assuming you mean a serious occupation as an inquiry, as a search. There, I think it's particularly important to actually, if you take something seriously, not simply to believe it, as I often say, believing something or is at the same level as dismissing something. It brings about no transformation. All serious teaching, you can 
look at it from what Krishna says or what the Buddha says or what Christ says or anybody else. All serious teaching calls upon the searchers to undertake any practice that will assist their whole being to be transformed. So they can hear what one does not ordinarily hear. They can see what one does not ordinarily see. It's really to do with cleansing of perceptions. That's one way of putting it. There are many other ways of saying something like this. You need to find the right mind or the right heart. That's another way of saying all this. Therefore, a serious student, from my point of view, would temporarily accept something, because if you right away dismiss it, then you don't try it. <laughs> try anything. But there is a very interesting existential tension. I need to rely upon my experience. But if I dismiss everything that is not my experience, then I'm not open to the possibility that in a year, two years, 10 years, 10 lifetimes, I would have a different experience. So if I hear the Buddha say something, but it's certainly not part of my experience, but if I just dismiss it, then I will never be able to even approach this or in that direction. So, but this is a very interesting tension. On the other hand, if I just easily accept something which doesn't really correspond to anything in me, then I can be emotionally, intellectually exploited. Anybody can convince me of anything. And there are endless gurus around. Who is, it's a big business. <laughs> so therefore, to maintain this subtle tension existentially, this is what I partly mean by saying to actually wrestle with, precisely because you take it seriously. Otherwise, it's, you know, don't forget, there are more than 7 billion people. 120 million of them will die between today and a year from now, just like us. So to imagine that human beings are really getting somewhere is just a grand idea. But this, I don't think any more than puppies are getting anywhere, <laughs> any of them die. I think to maintain the flame of search actually alive and burning is not so easy. Partly because there are many demands in the world. Everybody's life is full of all kinds of demands, just sheer survival. But then, even in oneself, to maintain the flame alive and to keep it actually a flame is many, many obstructions, such as self-deception, self-importance. So, of course, if you have a wise teacher, that is a great help. But at least in my experience, there are not many very wise teachers in the world. But that again, I don't need to be so convinced of this, but I'm just telling you from my own experience. Or a teacher can be helpful up to a point, and then they need to sort of be a little aside. But there is always a temptation to hang on, you know, <laughs> because a possessiveness until somebody is really, in fact, freed of this completely, which will require a very high degree of realization. So I think if one has a community of fellow searchers, or what is called Sangha in Buddhism, for example, or that is also the meaning of Ecclesia in Christianity. Ecclesia doesn't refer to the church building. It really refers to the community of searchers, or believers, they would say. And I think they, that community doesn't have to be people who just like each other and just are supporting each other, whatever nonsensical thing one says or does. But more and more freedom from one's likes and dislikes to actually getting a little taste of what is true. That, in my judgment, is a great help. Of course, if there is a wise teacher, that is a wonderful help. But 
a community is a little easier to find, even if you begin with just one or two or three other people. In fact, if you actually have more than a dozen or so, it actually then has more probability of factionalism <laughs> arising. Already there is a bit of a problem. So when one speaks about a community, I'm not talking about a large crowd here. Just a few people who are fellow searchers and trying to be more and more impartial with regard to each other, with regard to themselves. Well, first of all, the book that you're referring to as Christ the Yogi, that title is not at all my favorite. It was initially published as the Yoga of the Christ. But American publishers, this was published in England in 1990, but the American publisher thinks or thought that it will sell better by this title. USA has one driving principle of what will make more money. <laughs> and so, and however, I was so appalled by this title and they insisted that they have the right to change it. After all, I'd never said that they can't change it, etc. However, after I kept insisting on it, then they said when they sell out of that stock, then will they change the title. So they did change the title, but again, a very academic sounding title. The Gospel of John in the Light of Indian Mysticism. In any case, it's the same book. So if you're buying one, don't buy all three of these. It's the same book. Yeah, I think that has probably had more, it's hard to say really whether anything has impact, anything one does. But first of all, it has been translated into many, many languages. The initial publisher actually went out of business. So nobody, no publisher is pushing for it. It's just somebody who reads it. If they get struck by it, then they try to find a publisher who would publish it in another language. And I get, now this was published in 1990. So it's already now 24 years ago. But even now, periodically, I get emails these days, earlier letters, even from Christian monks or priests or lay people who seem to find that it gives them a slightly different perspective on their own gospel. It's really, I did not know this, but I was told by a historian of Christianity, apparently, I'm actually quite surprised that if this is true, but apparently no non-Christian has written a whole commentary on John's Gospel, which quite surprises me, but that's what I'm told. So if it is true, so this may be the first commentary written by a, almost a card-carrying non-Christian. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not a Christian by any kind of a background, but I have increasingly a very deep feeling for the teaching of Christ. It manifests in a slight, quite a different language from much of the way the teachings in India would be expressed. But from my point of view, actually to find radically different expressions of great truths is a good thing. If one is a searcher, of course, if you're a Hindu missionary and Christians express it differently, so obviously they're wrong. Or if you're a Christian missionary, then Hindus are obviously wrong. But that is a perspective, so missionaries can have it. But if you're a searcher, it can actually free you from the strong tendency to take the expression of truth for truth. Because all of these great teachers, the Buddha, Christ, Krishna, Lao Tse, they all say that real high realities can't be expressed in words, but they still need to say something in order to invite their followers to undertake the practices for transformation. They're not saying something in order to sh tell them how it is over there. They are actually trying to teach them how you can move from where you are so you could start moving towards over there. But this is the difficulty. So they have to use some words and of course, 
for example, Christ is very much in the Jewish tradition, so has a whole Hebrew background to it. And then every book in the New Testament is written in Greek. So the language that themselves control what can be said. And every language has a finesse. Some things can be very nicely said in one language than in the other language. So, but on the other hand, Indian text, certainly the classical text, will be in a Sanskrit, which has its own finesse. So I think the language, and not only the language, then of course, each place has its history. That also colors the way people express things very much. It's, for example, not easy for many contemporary Indians still to be free of the fact that they were really essentially India was enslaved for centuries. And that carries a little bit of a psychological. For example, Radhakrishnan, I mentioned this, has, was president of India and was a great philosopher. His translations, even of the Bhagavad Gita or of the Upanishad, always are slightly apologetic as if we are also as good as that. So he's always giving some references in the biblical tradition to justify something. But so for somebody like myself, this is completely silly. India hardly needs to justify itself. It has the grandest philosophic tradition of, of any place. But I find this kind of attitude, but it's inevitable for him. He's writing, he was brought up or educated in a Christian convent school, and India is enslaved, so he's trying to somehow so we are also in the running, <laughs> which from, from somebody like me, I mean, it is almost amazing that India needs to be justifying itself, philosophically particularly. So depending on different expressions come. From. It depends on what do you mean by yogi. If, somebody, if you think of yogi who can do the downward dog wonderfully <laughs> or, or can stand or stand or sit in some contorted physical position, that's one kind of yogi. And certainly, unfortunately, that's the kind that appeals to the media. So they're always having pictures of some character like this. Now, on the other hand, is Ramana a yogi? Is Aurobindo a yogi? Is Vivekananda a yogi? Yeah, then we are talking about a very different thing. The Buddha would be regarded classically a great yogi. They are the whole meaning of yoga even historically, even the word yoga is first used in the Katha Upanishad, traditionally. And it had much more emphasis actually on meditation. This is what was understood by yoga largely. Physical posture, etc. Well, as you well know, none of the classical texts of yoga, Bhagavad Gita or Patanjali, they even mention any posture of yoga. On the other hand, there is a very much an emphasis in any serious teaching on finding the right alignment. So asana is often translated as posture. It's actually more right alignment. And there, one can begin physically, but it's really much more emotional alignment, intellectual alignment. That's really, really the crucial aspect of these things. In any case, so speaking of yoga or a yogi as somebody who in fact has met the, what is regarded as the aim of yoga by Patanjali, by Krishna, by anybody else writing, or Shiv Sanghita, Yagavalakya Sanghita, or any of these texts, namely, freedom from ignorance. Now, that is not so easy. <laughs> now, I would personally feel this is where it's tricky. Am I able to know this, that somebody is free? No, I don't have that capacity because it's like, you know, when we take a photograph of something at a high speed running, you need a film that has a process which is faster than the rest. So for me to be able to say this about anybody, I myself need to be able to judge. I can't do that. But one brings a certain feeling. Yes, I have had a sense that Krishnamurti or Madame de Salzman were quite free of ignorance. 
they each have a slightly different way of expressing things. Also, I would have mentioned Roshi Kabori, who I met very much. I was very close to these people. Similarly, again, maybe I have not written very much about this, but I met Father Vasilius on Mount Athos, extraordinary person. I would regard him very highly. And one great Zen master in South Korea, Chulung Sunim, I have stories behind all of these people, how I met them. I didn't arrange to meet any of them. It's always the devas arranging this. But clearly the devas felt I needed some help, so they helped. <laughs> so I have met, I would say, four or five people in my life. You can't sort of make a hierarchy of this. It's very difficult because each one of them uses slightly different expressions and they come from different backgrounds, different even traditions, Christian, Buddhist, Krishnamurti maybe in a way would partly deny all of this, but he's obviously very much influenced by the Indian tradition. And Madame de Salzman, I mean, coming from Gurdjieff tradition, which is very much influenced by the Orthodox Christian tradition. Ultimately, these classical traditions always have a large effect. It's very difficult to completely get away from them. I'm always rather amused, however much, for example, one may say that Krishnamurti is not a Hindu, but we had this 26 volume encyclopedia called the Encyclopedic History of Human Spiritual Quest. So two volumes on Hinduism, two on Christianity. Which volume would have an article on Krishnamurti? The Hindu volume. The Muslims are not going to have him. The Christians are not going to. So one always, he may deny that he's not a Hindu, but all his perspective is much closer to the whole ongoing Hindu tradition than any other tradition. So if one slightly stands apart, so one finds that the great traditions have over the centuries crystallized certain perspectives of course, one can then repeat those in words. That doesn't carry the truth. But those who actually embodied them, who actually lived them, they can't, strictly speaking, no relatively modern formulation can be, can undo the traditional formulation. It's a very curious thing. The traditions at their best carry the truth and in general, they betray the truth. The word treason has the same root as the word tradition. So in general, the traditions are constantly betraying themselves. So it's, one needs to always ask, who represents the tradition? Personally, I feel, for example, Krishnamurti is very traditional, but he's gung-ho about against tradition in many of his expressions. Well, the word question may be itself a little tricky because one then imagines that you have some formulation in language. For me, it's really, if one has, one may begin with a formulated question, but if one is really serious and has a question, sooner or later, it becomes a quest. Then it shifts from saying, I have a question, to I am in question. So for me, one can still use words such as, why was I born, what happens when I die, etc. But those are all intended to slightly enlarge, if you like, the intellectually or mentally, the whole domain of what am I? And why am I here? I have at most another decade. Somebody may have five decades, ten decades or whatever. But the body will die. Is that the end? 
maybe. So, now, are these questions that, no, I think it's closer to a quest. <laughs> Sir, you were asking if I have an advice for any of the searchers. Yes, I would say, really, if you can actually take yourself seriously without heaviness, and there it is very important, if I can really emphasize this as much as I can, one needs to, there are many great teachers who have said many quite remarkable things. One can hear them, one can learn something from them. So in that sense, knowledge is not a bad idea. But it is very important not to be so much had by knowledge. Because even in principle, I cannot know all there is to know. If I base my whole life on what I know, so I'm already basing it on partiality. So what I need to be prepared for is whatever comes, rather than that it should be a continuation of what I know. So from my point of view, it's very important not to get so stuck on what one knows, but to be open to what, whatever may come. Willingness to be surprised, in my judgment, is really the mark of a person who is open to mystery. We actually have an, a saying in one of the Upanishads, actually it's repeated twice, it's in the Brahadaranik Upanishad, also repeated in Ishavasi Upanishad. Those who are committed to ignorance are in darkness, are in a great darkness, but those who are committed to knowledge are in a greater darkness. <laughs> so to be a little free of knowledge, it's a good idea. Thank you.